You could do it with anything. I don't care if you're making pots or you're a farmer or you're a tax consultant. Whatever it is you do, get into that as deeply as you can, and then truths will reveal themselves to you. And it'll be the same truths that will apply to every other aspect of life. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 163, and thank you for dropping in. On today's episode, we hear from Sensei Ando, a longtime martial arts practitioner, instructor, and the host of the Fight for a Happy Life podcast. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts two times each week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host, as well as the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you giving us a try. What are you wearing right now? (laughs) Seriously. If it's not a pair of our Cloud9 sweatpants, you're not as comfortable as you could be. Find them at whistlekick.com and buy yourself two pairs. Otherwise, you're not going to want to take them off long enough to wash. In all seriousness, this is a complaint we hear from parents that have purchased a pair for their children. And it's happened quite a few times. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And that's also the easiest place to sign up for our newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists which is an exclusive podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at headquarters, upcoming show guests, and even gets you some discounts on our products. My first experience with Sensei Ando was sort of a strange one, at least not one you might expect. About a year and a half ago, in an effort to promote martial arts podcasts overall, we put together a post we titled Best Martial Arts Podcast. Really creative title, right? It's no secret that we're not the only martial arts podcast And honestly, I personally listen to several of them. I've always liked the material that Sensei Ando included in his episodes, so we put him on the list. That inclusion led to some social media conversations and a number of emails. And a bit over a year later, we connected again and decided it was time that we get to put him through our questions here on the show. So let's welcome one of my favorite podcast hosts onto the show. Sensei Ando, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Mr. Lesniak, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, throwing titles back at me. I'm not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone deserves respect, even well, podcast hosts. <laughs> hey, I appreciate that. And honestly, the respect is that you've come on the show. And, you know, I'm sure I will talk about this a little bit in the intro, but I prefer to keep the intro short, as you and, and listeners out there know. Uh, in a sense, we are competitors. We, you also have what? a martial arts podcast. <laughs> I know, crazy, right? There's more what? than one of us. Uh, (laughs) but I like what you do. I listen to your show and I wanted to have you on as a guest because I think you're a cool guy. Back at you, sir. I am a big fan of your show as well. Um, and I don't see it as competition. I have no competition. That's the ego talking, (laughs) but then, uh, you know, uh, we also have no competition because we're all in the same, we're on the same team here. We just want to build a stronger martial arts community, particularly with the traditional martial arts and, um, make sure everyone knows that we're respectful to one another and that we can all coincide and promote the arts. So I'm with you here. Right. And because I want to mention it a few times because I want people to check it out. If people are listening to this show, you like martial arts and you like podcasts and they, you will probably like Sensei Ando's show as well, which is titled fight for a happy life. I really like the name. I'm kind of jealous of the name. Martial (laughs) Martial arts radio is about as generic as boring as you get. And uh, yes, but it's great for your search engines. (laughs) Nobody can find my podcast at all. That was a big mistake. So, well, Good for you. We do. We, we each do some things well and maybe some other things not so well. <laughs> That's right. So th- that gives the listeners a little bit of why I've asked you to come on the show. But other than that, they don't really know much about you. So let's let's get started. How did you get started as a martial artist? Um, my story is not so unique. Uh, <laughs> Um, for me, it's all about control. Um, in my teenage years, like a lot of young men, I was kind of uh, full of myself and a little confused and looking for some role models. And like a lot of people growing up in the 70s, I saw, yes, I'm going to say it, prepare for the groan, Bruce Lee. Yep, yeah, maybe you've heard of him. Uh, I saw Enter the Dragon and a bunch of his films. And uh, to be honest, I was never impressed with his fighting Um, (laughs) I thought the movies weren't really all that great and the fight scenes were, you know, he hits everybody, everybody dies. It's fantastic. Um, but I just could not get over his attitude, number one, 
and the control of his body. I was just really impressed by his physique. And I just thought, I want that. I want the physique and I want that attitude, that swagger that he had. So I'm going to do whatever he does. So I went down uh, on my bike <laughs> down to the local. There was like a boxing supply store and they had those books, um, that little series, uh, Bruce Lee's Fighting Method. And I took those books and those were my Bible for a couple of years. I just took those apart and anything I saw on that, what's that stationary bike? What's that weights? What's he's running? What's he doing on that? It was a chi sao somehow on a, on a ladder. What's he doing? So I just did everything I could to model his physique. Um, and yeah, put up a heavy bag in the garage and just beat the heck out of it. And, and I was very happy <laughs> doing that. I thought this is it. Uh, even bought the Kung Fu suit for no reason, wearing it around the garage, invited friends over to spar, you know, try to just do it on my own. But at some point, um, I saw Steven Seagal in Above the Law, and that was another life-changing moment because this was a guy who did not have the physique. <laughs> he had the same attitude. He had the same swagger, maybe even more, but I couldn't tell what he was doing. He wasn't jumping around, ripping off his shirt, throwing punches and kicks. He was just standing there brooding, and for some reason, people were flipping around him, and I couldn't figure it out. I put that VCR on slow-mo. I'm like, what the hell is he doing? Why is this guy – he's got a knife one second, and somehow he's doing a somersault backwards. How? I couldn't figure it out, and so I realized that I needed to go learn technique. I, there was more to martial arts than just abs and flexibility. I needed to go find a teacher. Um, and I was raised, born and raised in Buffalo, New York. And at that time, I could not find any Aikido teachers. So um, I ended up in a Taekwondo school. Actually, it's a, a judo school, which also also hosted a Taekwondo program. Um, Kin Tora in Buffalo, New York. They're still around. Uh, and it was a wonderful place uh, to get involved in martial arts. I didn't particularly – I didn't know what Taekwondo was. I didn't really care. What I saw was punches and kicks. Okay, I know that. I thought I did. Um, and they have a heavy bag. Okay, I understand that. And they had weights. I thought, okay, so even if this Taekwondo or whatever you call this is a total joke, um, at least I can lift weights here and hit the bag. So uh, I signed up and um, got involved. And I'm kind of an OCD person. So once I started, I couldn't stop. And uh, as fate would have it, about a year later, an Aikido teacher appeared uh, at the same facility. So they were running their judo program. They ultimately had a jujitsu program. They had the Taekwondo program. They had an Aikido program all under the same roof. And um, at the time, I just thought that's the way every martial arts school was. I didn't realize how rare that was, that these guys could all be on alternate nights, classes back to back, two mats running. And it was just like this beautiful university experience where you could observe other arts and talk to other stylists and um, participate in the seminar over here or this class over there and just – you have this nice broad view of all martial arts. So long story short now, the summation of that would be Bruce Lee got me in because of the physique and the body control. And then Steven Seagal got me to go out and actually find a teacher and start learning technique. You know, Steven Seagal is such an influential figure in our culture, in our martial arts culture. And it's a shame that over the last five, 10 years or so, he's become so controversial and so almost the the inverse of what i remember him starting out as um yes I, i'm not going to make any further comment on yeah. steven seagal <laughs> yeah, i don't want to get shot i don't want to get in trouble <laughs> i'm not here to offend anybody he's doing his thing that's his journey Sorry. and uh i'm grateful for uh what he alerted me to and maybe get out of my own garage and out into the world and yeah. uh, it changed my life so i'm always uh, it will be in, to his debt for that absolutely absolutely so it's a great story. We love stories here. I love stories. That's the whole foundation of this show. I'm sure you got a whole bunch more. What's your best martial arts story? I know this is like your favorite question. It's my it, least favorite it really question. Is. <laughs> I hate this question. I always hope I had – I was hoping something would happen between the time you said, hey, do you want to be on the show? <laughs> and now like the, the, the Yakuza came after me or I saved a plane from crashing, something. Uh, I'm a pretty boring guy, actually, and um, but something did happen uh, about a year and a half ago that has haunted me, and I'm still trying to process it. So maybe if I share that, um, it'll be interesting to somebody. Maybe not. Um, when I started martial arts at Kintora in Buffalo, um, the Taekwondo program uh, had a lead instructor, 
and let's say an assistant instructor. And there was a third stylist who was a friend of the other instructors, but he wasn't a Taekwondo guy. He was like an Okinawan karate stylist. So as a young man uh, looking for role models, um, again, I had this not only multiple arts in the same school, but I had three different guys, and they were very different guys. One was clinical and analytical. One was uh, very into the fitness uh, first. One was a multiple uh, black belt in different styles and was just all about the flow and improvisation and creativity. So these guys all became kind of like my Avengers. Like Each one has their own little special superpower. Um, I gave each one of them a separate notebook. Uh, what did Mr. X tell me? What did Mr. Y tell me? What did Mr. Z tell me? And for the time that I was there, um, I, I, these guys became like mytho mythological creatures to me. This guy represents the brain. This guy represents the body. This guy represents the spirit, let's say. And when I left Buffalo uh, in my early 20s, I moved out to Los Angeles and um, I left the school. And this is before the internet. And I lost touch with them. All three of those guys lived off the grid. Um, there was no internet. Um, they stopped teaching at that school. The program closed for a while and that was it. So now we jump forward 20 years or more. And, uh, in my mind, these guys are still very much alive. When I started teaching, I would remember the tip that someone gave me and I'd be passing that on. So I was always thinking about them. When I review my notebooks, I'd always go back and look at the wisdom that they had told me 20 years earlier. And now some of the things that they were telling me that I had written down started making more sense to me and took on deeper meanings. Right. So I, fortunately, <laughs> like two years ago or so, year and a half or so, uh, I did I, my, my annual search, like, are any of these guys still alive or any of these guys out there? Can I find them? I'd really like to know what they've been doing all these years. And by luck, I did able, I was able to find the Okinawan stylist. And I thought, oh my God, this is fantastic. He's alive and he's back teaching again. He's actually back at Kintora teaching his karate program, Ruku Kempo, actually. And so I, I reached out to him and he said, yeah, next time you're in town, come by, let's work out. And I was just, I mean, this was really, it would be like meeting, you know, Spider-Man or something. I was like, oh my God, because they had grown, these guys had all grown in my head to such epic proportions, uh, Greek gods. So I go back and uh, I get to Kintora and this gentleman was not only kind enough and generous enough to come down to meet me, but he had called the other two instructors so that they would be there too. And for like three or four hours, there was no class going on. They had opened the facility just for me. We were all standing in this room again, the old dojo, and it was just eerie right? Because it was just this surreal experience where these guys, I, I wasn't even sure if these guys really existed. Maybe they're just figments of my imagination from the past, but there they all were. And we went and had, uh, you know, some uh, dinner afterwards. And what really struck me, I'm getting to the point, what struck me was that they were all still exactly who they were when I left. They had all continued training. They'd all gone deeper into their arts, which you would expect, but they were all still incredibly different. One was still very analytical and had the prejudices that that kind of mind has. The other one was very creative and artistic and flowing. And he still had argu arguments with the other guy about which style and which approach was better for training. And then the fitness guy had his say. And it was the same bickering, the same differences of opinion, the same mutual respect and camaraderie. And that it had lasted decades. And for me, as an older guy now, I'm 46, um, I don't think you could learn this lesson in your 20s. You couldn't. You couldn't learn this even in your 30s. I'm sure it's just going to deepen as I get older and older. But what it made me realize was this really is martial arts. Art meaning this is a personal expression of this project of fighting. And no matter what style you're in, no matter who your teacher is, what your lineage is, you are you. Your strengths are your strengths, your biases are your biases, your weaknesses are your weaknesses, and the sooner you can be aware of them and start using them to your advantage, the better. Because the guy who weighed like 250, 260 still weighed 250, 260. The guy who was wiry thin and very dynamic was still wiry thin and dynamic. Each of them, even though they'd progressed and gotten better in their arts, were, were still trapped by their weaknesses and uh, very – skilled with their strengths. So for us as martial artists, you, me, anybody who's listening, 
being able to look at your life from beginning till now and really start seeing the patterns of what makes you you. Who are you? What are you really good at? What are you not so good at? And particularly as you get older, you better start playing those strengths more, go deeper into those and just take those weaknesses. And yeah, you can be aware of them. You can try to hodgepodge some type of strategy to to hide them. But ultimately, you got to just move past them and don't worry about them because nobody's going to be great at everything. The 250 pound guy is never going to be as wiry and as elusive as the thin guy. And the thin guy is never going to have the pressure with body weight that the big guy's got. So there's no point driving yourself crazy trying to be a master of everything. That's not going to happen. Part of this art of the journey of martial arts is to really discover who you are, find your strengths, and play those as hard as you can. Deepen your relationship with those things. So again, I don't know if that means anything to anybody, but at this point in my life, it was a really big deal because it made me stop and go, well, then who am I? Am I sitting at this table right now with these three guys? Are they looking at me like, yep, that's the same old Ando. He's still arrogant. He's still, you know, trying to laugh as a defense mechanism. What, what are his deals? And I have to go back and go, yeah, yeah, what am I? Who am I? What am I working well? And what should I just get past and stop trying to hang on to or try to fix and just say, this is the, these are the cards I'm dealt. Play them. So I don't know if any of that makes sense, but it's been haunting me ever since it happened. And uh, I just thought I'd share that. Well, I'm glad you, you did you can edit all that out. No, no. Why would I edit that out? That was that was gold. That was brilliant. I, I think there's a lot there, and I'm not going to pretend to have the context or or the the life experience to unpack that. But you know, I I can see what you're talking about. You know, and I I felt like I was there, and and you opened up a couple doors in my head uh, on some okay. things to think about. So I like that. I was like, when people make me think. So thank you. All right. <laughs> I'll be shorter now. All my other answers, I'll be much shorter. That's no, it. no need. No <laughs> need. Go as long as you want. Uh, Tony Blauer holds the record at two and a half hours. That's right. I listened to all that. Yeah. He's a fascinating guy. That um, A lot of people have listened to both parts of that and mm-hmm. uh, both versions, the um, the clean version and then mm-hmm. the um, the raw version. <laughs> Oh, so you let him swear? Wait, I've got, I can retell that story much better. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, um, yeah, if I hadn't, then there wouldn't have been an interview. So I understand. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, you don't <laughs> swear on your week. show, so I figured you'd be okay with, with that restriction. That's right. That was my strategy. Let's keep it family friendly. I want everyone to hear it. I want ev- I want as many people to be in the martial arts as possible, so I'm not going to offend people with language. If that's the only issue then i can clean it up that's no problem (laughs) that's my goal too so that's that's why you're here that we're we we need to i don't know get a couple other uh justice league members together and we (laughs) that's right i don't know maybe maybe we can reach out to jared wilson maybe he'll come back you went dc on me there i'm talking about the avengers and you went all dc well hey you know i got i got to keep everybody guessing once in a while (laughs) all right (laughs) so obviously you're a passionate martial artist i mean there's no question about that but are there other things in your life that you're dedicated to any other hobbies? Nope. Okay. <laughs> when, when I was a younger man, I was, uh, you know, I, Hey, I loved art. I was in bands. I loved music, writing music, got uh, keyboard guitars all over the place. I still have them here, but they're all covered in dust. And, um, again, this growing old thing really changes things sort of one at a time, starting my early twenties, I started realizing that you can't possibly be great at anything if you're spreading your time around. So I can't spend, oh, I'm going to paint and I'm going to go write a song. Now I'm going to go practice martial arts and now I'm going to go write a screenplay and I'm going to go try some acting and I'm going to do stand-up comedy. I love everything. I I love life. I mean, I will never be bored. Um, I'm not a sit on the beach kind of guy. Um, But as I've gotten older and my energy's going down and my body's getting a little stiffer and I realize the Grim Reaper is coming for me, um, I'm just going to pick my battles. So I dropped art in my 20s dropped music in my 30s, dropped screenplays and acting and stand-up comedy uh, in my 30s, and just said, you know what? Uh, the most significant thing that's ever uh, affected me in life has been martial arts. That has been always been my number one. Um, I did it just as a private thing. When, even on my acting resume, I didn't put down martial arts or anything like that. I, I didn't make references to it. I just kept it private. It was just, just for me. It was my therapy. It was my gym. It was my everything. So then when I got a job actually teaching martial arts, when I was finally in need to pay the rent, 
and I got a great job at uh, Don Barnes Karate Kids here in Los Angeles. Um, it was, and they've been very good to me. And I was able to make a full-time job and a salary out of uh, hiring and firing teachers and uh, being on the mats all the time with thousands of kids. Um, I tell you, it just – it put everything really right in order. I felt like I'm at home. This is it. Uh, learning and passing it on, learning and passing it on, becoming, if I can, one of the epic – Greek gods, the same way that my teachers were to me, I believe that's our duty as martial artists to pass it on. If something changed your life, how the hell can you keep that a secret? How are you going to sit on that? It is your duty to pass that on to the next generation of good guys, team good guys, who needs that strength, who needs that empowerment, um, who needs that life wisdom to help them get through the day. Um, so yeah, uh, once I got to this certain age, I said, that's it. No more privacy, no more hiding. I'm going to start this blog. That's That was what was behind all of that. I, before that, didn't have a Facebook page, no Twitter, no friends, nothing. It was my wife, myself, uh, my training, my teachers. That's it. And uh, once I started getting on the mats as a professional, um, I took it way more seriously. So nowadays, if I'm doing Kung Fu, then BJJ is my hobby. If I'm doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, then Kung Fu is my hobby. Uh, <laughs> I'm all about martial arts 24-7, um, and that's it. And I think that there's a, a strong lesson in there, and it's one that I'm starting to realize myself about dedicating yourself to something so you can get the most out of it. Yeah. I think that's the only way to be truly wise. You could do it with anything. I don't care if you're making pots or you're a farmer or you're a tax consultant. Whatever it is you do, get into that as deeply as you can, and then truths will reveal themselves to you. And it'll be the same truths that will apply to every other aspect of life. But there's no way you should put pressure on yourself if you're a great Italian chef to also be a great Chinese chef. That doesn't make sense. If you're a great jazz musician, there's no point trying to be a great classical musician. Do what you do. <laughs> be the best of who you're supposed to be, and everything else makes sense. It just falls into place. The life just is a beautiful place to be. Don't confuse yourself. Pick something. For sure. We all go through challenging times, you know, rough spots whether it's personal or professional. I mean, there, there's a multitude of things that affect people every day. Tell us about a time in your life that didn't go the way you wanted it to and how your martial arts training helped you overcome. Whew. Um, you know, I'm not really a drama guy. So when I look back at my life, whether it's, oh, your parents got divorced or, oh, you, you can't make any money or, oh, I don't, um, I've never really taken it personally. I've always felt kind of like a student of the universe and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I don't really, I don't really carry drama around too much, but, um, but in terms of disappointments or surprises in life or having to adapt, um, well with the website, for instance, this is my biggest experience in life. Um, you know, when I started the website, I was, I thought for sure that no male in the human species would ever listen to me, would ever take me seriously. Uh, because if you're going to come out as a martial artist on YouTube or on a blog, I don't have any tattoos. I have no scars. I wasn't in the military. I'm not a bouncer. I'm not a cop. Um, I'm not a world champion of any kind. So why the hell would anybody listen to me? That was always my greatest insecurity. So I said, well, I'll go the other way. I'm not going to wear a uniform on the website. I'm just going to be like Dr. Phil. I'll just be Sensei Ando. I'll give out life advice and uh, since I, I, I seem to get along with middle-aged women, <laughs> there's a lot of moms at the, the karate schools, I figured, you know what, that's probably who will show up. They seem to like it, my little speeches. So that's my target audience. I'm going to go after the Oprah crowd and try to give them a, a, an in, a safe, accessible, friendly way to look at the world of martial arts in a safe way by spinning some beautiful stories and uh, that kind of thing. And boy, that was just a soul-crushing experience for a couple of years, uh, writing articles, doing the podcast. Um, it went nowhere in my opinion. It was just my, my traffic was zero. I just, nobody cared. And that was my best shot. I mean, I, I wasn't, I was trying my hardest. I was giving it everything I got. I'm pulling out the late nights. I'm rewriting scripts. I'm like, no, this has got to work. They told me, don't give up, keep believing in yourself, do all that. But all that inspirational advice is a bunch of nonsense. If you're doing the wrong thing, Right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to say, don't give up. No, you absolutely should give up if it's not working. Absolutely. Um, it's just a question of how long it's going to take you to get that message. 
And uh, because I'm kind of OCD, it took me a while. It took me a couple of years before I said, you know what? This is not working. Your, <laughs> your attempt to attract the Oprah crowd is a complete abysmal failure. You've been knocked out. You've been cut. You've been bled out, boy. So um, I said, well, before I shut this thing down, before I just say, okay, enough, the world doesn't want this, I'm going to put up a video. Why not? Let's put up a video. And I'm going to talk about you know, really technical, stupid things that only – a young martial artist might care about. And to my sh whole shock, people liked it. And there was, there was more than 10 views, which, which I couldn't believe. There were strangers showing up and watching videos, not my family. Actually, even my family doesn't watch my videos <laughs> most of the time. So I, I was shocked. And it, ever since then, there's been a momentum going with the videos. Um, even the podcast, I mean, it's grown for sure, but it's still not uh, anywhere near what the videos are doing. And they're mostly guys. According to YouTube analytics, it's 90% guys. The very audience I thought would cast me out and mock me and rip me apart in the comments. I mean, I get very few thumbs down. I get very little hate, very few challenges. Uh, I just cannot believe. I'm still shocked that the people are watching these things and seeing that I'm being sincere and I'm just trying to share something and and they're not trying to tear down my parade. They're actually letting me do it and seem to be supportive. So. Is, as a martial arts lesson, um, if your tricks aren't working, you better find new tricks. And uh, if that means letting go of your old vision and your old identity and whatever that is, um, I'm, I just can't believe the amount of happiness I have now. I was very cynical about human nature before. Like, ah, oh, nobody cares. I have all this wisdom and nobody's – everybody's too stupid to understand. I mean, you can go to really dark places where you're just this solipsistic universe – if I use that word correctly, you know, it's all about me and the whole world's against me, but it's quite the opposite. If you're doing the right thing, the world will come to you. They will meet you halfway. And that momentum, that's why I'm saying I have no other interests or hobbies because I feel like this is the calling now. This is what you're supposed to be doing. You've been looking at all kinds of things, uh, martial arts terms. I've been punched in the face at stand-up comedy, punched in the face in the movie business, punched in the face with all kinds of stuff. But here I am now. I figured it out. Like, oh, my God, people are actually responding and sending me emails and giving me thumbs up on videos. Like, OK, well, I actually like this the most. <laughs> so thank God uh, I kept trying to find something that would not only make me happy, but apparently uh, other people are responding to as well. So right now, this is the best time of my life. I've never been this happy. I've got more friends than ever. I'm now I'm out there. I'm not a public hiding kind of guy. I'm I'm all into the networking and meeting people and smiling and shaking hands, uh, all the stuff that I used to think was uh, beneath me or unnecessary or just not my thing, but it is my thing. It turns out I actually love people. <laughs> I actually want to help everybody if I can. I actually, I can't wait to meet more people this year and next year. It's just, I'm, I've never been happier, but um, it's because you keep swinging until you find the punch that lands. And then again, play your strengths, do your thing, run with it once you find it. Wow, you 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 kind of turned that around right there. I mean, I didn't I didn't even have to ask for the lesson or or tie it up for the listeners. I mean, it's like you've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it, and that's great stuff. And, and you know, the point that I do want to underscore is your willingness to to try different things, to keep throwing different stuff against the wall, so to speak. And when you found the thing that stuck, you embraced it. And I yes. think that. That's as much a business lesson as a martial arts lesson, as a life lesson. And I think it's something that I wish more people would be willing to learn, to, to open their eyes to, that there's always opportunity around you, that the path to your goal may not be the path that you thought it was going to be. Sometimes it yes. wanders. Sometimes it it goes behind you. I mean, how often have you been on a highway that, the sign says it's going east and you're going north to start with. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just got to you got to accept that life's going to take you on some some curves, but just keep plugging along driving forward and you're going to get there. Yes, sir. As and you... probably to a place that's better than you intended to get to. That's the exactly. magic of it. If I had been successful in the other goals that I had set for myself, I do not believe I would ever be as happy as I am today. So, you have to have some faith that the world knows what it's doing and it's guiding you in the direction you're supposed to go in. And when you keep hitting your head against the wall, it's because you're going the wrong way. So you got to 
in a martial arts sense, if you're feeling pain, you're going the wrong way. You're doing the wrong move. <laughs> You've got to start moving towards uh, yielding sometimes or pushing forward to where there's less pressure, to where there's less pain, to where there's less resistance. Uh, that's the that's the life lesson. So you can feel it physically when you're rolling and sparring, um, but it's also going on all the time when just your normal relationships and business. If you're hitting obstacles, you got to find another way around that. Don't keep slamming into that wall. Go, go over it. Go around it. Go under it. Go the other way. Find another direction to try. But absolutely, um, keep trying stuff. Keep throwing. For sure. Let's talk about competition. Have tournaments or, or other events like that ever been part of your martial arts training? No. Next question. Okay. <laughs> Can I ask why? <laughs> um, tournaments just, just never did it for me. I... You know what? I'm kind of a competitive person, um, mostly with myself, though. And there's a lot of things about competition. I mean, just the technical aspects of it. I just don't understand. I don't understand kata competition at all. I, I have I know it's positioned to be in the next Olympics, and a lot of people are excited about it. But I don't get it. I just – I mean, how do you judge – a kata. I've done it. We have little tournaments around, and I'll sure I'll, I'll sit on the panel. Okay, you look strong, but um, it doesn't make sense to me. That's like saying, "Oh, this is the best song of the year. This is the best movie. This is the best spaghetti in town." Like, what are you talking about? This is a personal preference. This is not measurable. If we have a weightlifting contest, okay, I see you lifted more than I did. You win. But to come up and reveal yourself through a performance of movement, kata. And to say that someone's focus is better than someone else's or someone's explosiveness or someone's posture or someone's rhythm, what are, we, what are you talking about? The kata, for instance, is a tool to enhance your fighting skills, okay? That's the purpose really of, of the kata. Otherwise, you could just do freestyle dance and get a workout and work on your balance and strength. And you can work on those attributes a million different ways. The point of a kata is that it's supposed to have some connection to combative movement to combative technique. So it's a tool. Do you want to watch me do push-ups? No. Do you want to judge me on how I do my push-ups? And let's have a contest. Let's see if you can do the better push-up. Is this really worth anybody's time? So why am I sitting here judging that your kata is better than his kata or her kata? What? I just don't get that at all. And then does that make sense? I don't know. Is that, is that too extreme? It does. No, no, absolutely. And you're not the first person to make those comments. I'm I had to muffle my laughter because for 18 months laugh. when whistle kick laugh. When, laugh. When, when we would set up at events we ran a push-up competition. Oh no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> well, okay, but what was the competition? How you looked doing the push-up or no. how many you could no, do in was, a certain it amount was, of time? It was over time. How many in a minute? Measurable. Okay, well that's fine by me. Uh, you know, <laughs> judging rhythmic gymnastics, I just don't I don't I don't get it. So for me that's a problem. But in sparring, uh, same thing. To me, you only have so much training time. And my goal is self-defense, okay? I understand that people may have different goals in martial arts. That's fine. But for me, if it's martial arts, it has to be martial. That's what makes it different than yoga or dance class or CrossFit. It's martial. You should be experiencing near death and you should be experiencing killing in every one of your classes. That's the way it should be because that teaches life lessons that yoga misses and CrossFit misses. So in sparring, it's not always a kill competition or a kill or be killed. Uh, it's working on techniques that look a certain way or get a certain kind of a point or they, there's a lot of restrictions. And I know it's, a, it's an age old thing like, well, my techniques are too deadly to use in competition. Yeah, but there's another point here. For instance, um, before I started Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I've been doing that for a few years now, and I'm enjoying it. But uh, before that, if I went to the ground with someone, like in a kung fu class, instantly my hands are going to the face, going to the groin, going to some small joint, something, pull the hair, back of the head, all the stuff you're not supposed to do. And when I started taking Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu um, – you know, that, that's, those aren't the proper hand positions. Oh, you block the hip, you know, go work the head a little bit. Okay, okay. And I, that scared me at first. It really frightened me because what happened was after about six months and I'm rolling really hard and someone's coming on really fast and I felt my hand automatically go to the what I would consider the wrong place if this was a real fight. Instead of grabbing the groin or going for the throat or going for the eye, it's going just to block a hip or block a shoulder, 
something larger, gross motory, instead of something more finely tuned to get somebody off of you with pain and discomfort. And that scares me. And it's the same thing with stand-up sparring. I mean, there's a big difference when you're between bouncing around and trying to lunge in and close that gap really fast or presenting yourself uh, as someone who doesn't know anything about fighting and having an attacker close the gap for you and then uh, exploding into any, you know, any, any choice of technique you want, but probably something that's illegal. And people can say, well, well, blah, blah, blah. But look, it does make a difference. How you practice is how you're going to fight. And I understand that the MMA guys are elite athletes and they're fantastic. I'm a huge fan. I watch. But I also know that when you wire your body a certain way, you're going to react a certain way. And if you're not an elite athlete in your 20s who can rain down holy hell with kicks and punches and uh, legal techniques, if you're my mother, you're not going to go take a Muay Thai class, right? If you're my grandma, I'm not going to tell her to go participate in BJJ and maybe do a couple of competitions for self-defense. I'm going to give them a much more narrow band of things to do, things that use the equalizer techniques, the, the, the dirty fighting or the illegal techniques. And I want those hardwired into them so that every time you practice, that's where your hand goes. That's what your body does. These are the feelings you bring up. And to me, it's just, I don't like playing in that gray area of, okay, well, this is my tournament technique, but this is my self-defense technique. I don't like compartmentalizing. I want to go deep in what I do. I, I don't want to, again, be it seems close to an outsider. Oh, yeah, sparring, sports sparring is just the same as self-defense, or they're close enough. It's punching and kicking, right? No, it's not. It's not the same. And the more you get into self-defense, the more you realize that sparring is not even close. And the more you just do tournament-style sparring, the more you realize, like, hey, this isn't really like self-defense, unless you're a little delusional. I'm not saying you can't use sparring techniques in self-defense. Sure you can. But it also – most of those techniques favor being fast, young, strong, explosive – agile, athletic. And for me, most martial artists don't fall into that category. Professionals do, but not mainstream mom, dad, kids. Most don't. So they can't, they're not helped by Muay Thai. They're just not. <laughs> they need something else. So for those reasons, you know, I, hey, if there's a tournament going, I'll watch. I mean, if it's on TV, it almost never happens. The Olympics never covered all the combative sports enough. But, um, I'll watch, but I, I definitely don't want to participate in it. That was a very in-depth and well-thought-out answer. I mean, we've had people on the show who don't compete, and you know they, they've they've expressed it uh, as doesn't really interest me, or you know doesn't really fit with my philosophy. But I think you've done the best job I've ever heard personally of an argument against competition. Now, obviously. <laughs> people out there know I, I like competition we we make products I for competition <laughs> you know but i think it's important to understand that it doesn't have to be for everyone that martial <laughs> arts is broad and has many different styles and ways of training in those styles because there are different types of people that are looking for different things absolutely true and i fall back on my personal goal that everyone do martial arts at some point in their lives. And, and we were talking before the show and you said something similar. So I know we're mm -hmm. on the same page. Absolutely. So it's okay that you're not into competing and there are other people that are. And I hope people out there that are listening that heard that answer aren't offended because it wasn't an attack. No. Hey, you do what you want to do. Like I said, you play your strengths. If something makes you happy, then you go do that thing. Yeah. Um, but just be honest about what you're doing and don't, confuse yourself about, especially when you portray it to other people. Um, I do, like you, want, I would love it if everybody, all the good people in the world, because there are way more good people than bad people. Bad people get all the attention. All the good people, if we all were training, imagine if everybody listening to the show brought one friend or family member to a class. If, if everybody in the world of martial arts brought a friend or family member and actually was successful in bringing them to a class. Those are so many more good people empowering themselves and whatever it is that you need to do with your life, however that changes your life, not just self-defense, but posture, breathing, fitness, self-reliance, all of the things that we get from martial arts training, all the things that changed your life, that changed my life, that changed anybody who's listening's life. Why wouldn't we want to share that with everybody? We're doing a very poor job of promoting the martial arts. That's just the way it is. Traditional martial arts seem to be on a downward trend for, for a long time now. Uh, it's just sad because we're not marketing it. We're not 
bringing it to light the way it should be. So this is a a huge problem, and I, I just feel like the, the, the traditional arts in, in particular are just drowning. And um, but it all starts with us. We have to be better role models. We have to be more public about how we train and why we train and make sure people feel safe to join you and they don't have these stereotypes in their head that they're going to get hurt or it's going to cost too much money or whatever. Everybody can share <laughs> some of their martial arts with somebody. And if we all imagine if it was in the school system, I, 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 I've got to figure out how to do that. We've got to, I mean, if you're going to, other countries have people standing up doing jumping jacks and calisthenics at the beginning of the day. Imagine if all the good people in the world as a routine in their day stood up 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just move their body, reassert, you know, assert to themselves that I am worth defending. Uh, there are good things in life that are worth protecting and just make that your oath that you know who you are, you know what you're going to fight for and that you commit yourself to fighting for those things and you have the tools to do it, whether that's just patience or perseverance or power, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I, I know that's the vision you would like for the world. That's the vision I share, and uh, that's why it's great that you're you have a podcast that builds a community. You know, let's other martial artists know that they're not alone and they're not crazy. Hey, we all saw Bruce Lee. Hey, you know, we're all taking kicks to the head, and we're not crazy. This is good stuff, but we're doing a poor job as a group of inviting other people in and making them feel welcome and letting them see that this is absolutely worth their time. That's it. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing I can say that enhances that. So I'm just going to move on. All right. <laughs> Other than your initial instructor, because I think for a lot of us, that's the person that has been, sure. had, had, has had such an impact on us. Yeah. Who would you identify as the most influential person on your martial arts upbringing? Yeah, this one will, this might make you puke puke a little bit, but um, I'm going to go with my wife. One, because I know she won't hear this show. She doesn't listen to this stuff. So um, I can I can say stuff. <laughs> I can get away with saying everything I want. Um, but really, my wife, she's been together. Uh, we've been together almost as long as I've been training in martial arts. We've been together uh, 26 years. And um, so she's been here through almost all of my training experiences. And um, the thing is, uh, you know, the opposites of track kind of stuff. I'm pretty much a pretty laid back and passive guy. Um, but she's just all fighter. Um, she's not a martial artist at all, not interested, but, um, you know, she was an all American soccer player. And what's interesting is that she was like a sweeper, right? The, the, the defensive position, like all the way in the back, uh, by the goalie yet she led the team in scoring. So this is someone who wants the ball, will drive with that ball is aggressive. will get in your face. will stand up. Uh, she's all attack and no step back. And so as an influence for me, um, I always have that in my head because I see her every day and I got the ring on my finger. So it's a constant reminder that there is another way to approach problems. There is a time to absolutely fight. And it's kind of a, well, what would your wife do right now? What would Kate do? And, uh, I think it's really healthy to have that as a daily reminder. So this is very impactful. It's not like, well, 10 years ago, I met this guy who said something. Yeah, that's nice. But Every single day, almost in every conversation and every single thing that happens uh, between us, it's a reminder like, okay, you can stand up for yourself. You can speak back. You can get the dinner that you ordered when they give you the wrong food. You can do these things, and that's okay. It's not always okay. You still need my half of the, of the yin-yang. Uh, there is a time to yield and to step back and just be passive. But uh, I love having her in my life to remind me like – no, you can be a ferocious tiger and there's a time and place for that. And don't forget it. And that didn't make me throw up at all. <laughs> I think anytime someone's going to dedicate themselves to something so, so wholeheartedly, and, and now it's gone beyond a hobby. Now it's part of your professional sphere and really more than part of, because you said it's, it's teaching and, and working in, in a martial arts school or, or part of your job. So there's a lot there. So if without her support, that's not really mm -hmm. going to work. True. And one of the things I found is that even if someone has has chosen a spouse that is not a martial artist, they have to have something that they're similarly passionate about. They've got to be able to comprehend that passion. I'm guessing that she has something in her life. Right. If she's that fiery. 
Right. So she can understand. Uninterested in. Just to be fair, she doesn't come watch me do martial arts, and I don't go watch what she does. I think that's a fair, (laughs) a fair exchange in a relationship. We can both ignore large parts of their lives. (laughs) (laughs) Well, not to turn this into the the whistle kick uh, romantic relationship (laughs) advice show, but one of the things I believe wholeheartedly is that if couples do everything together, then eventually they run out of stuff to share and teach the other and to, to use, to lift the other up. You become the same person. Absolutely true. I mean, you, um, I may have said this before, but you have to look, if you're in a relationship with a, with a wife, your significant other, whoever that person is for you, uh, your dog, I don't know. Um, (laughs) I'm not judging. Uh, you have to look at them as like a sparring partner. It's really the same thing. A good sparring partner is going to challenge your beliefs, is going to call you out, is going to look through your your nonsense and make you reevaluate, reevaluate who you are and what are you doing? The, what's interesting is after 26 years, um, you're the stuff that's still here, like I was talking about with me meeting back up with my old instructors uh, after 26 years. Now the relationship is settled. It's not like, well, you know, I am willing to compromise this, but I'm not willing to compromise that, and I never will. When we were like in our 20s, there was a long period there where uh, if she said, hey, you're like this and you're like that and I don't like that, then I would go back and reflect on it. Like, yeah, maybe I could change that or, yeah, maybe I am a little unfair in this particular issue. Um, And I did make some changes, and that's the healthy part of it. You learn and you grow and you see things from another perspective. That's very healthy. But then after – into the late 30s and now into the 40s, you say, okay, now the patterns are set. I've reevaluated, I've reflected, I've considered your point of view, and I keep coming back to this. This is me, and now I'm going to play those cards all the way out. And love it or leave it, that's part of that self-awareness. You you were sparring with this person on a daily basis, and they call you out, they hit you, they hurt you, they love you, they support you, and in that, that tangled mess of emotions, you find out who you are, and that should only give you more confidence to be who you are and then walk out of that door with a big smile because you know for sure you just uh, survived another round at home <laughs> in a positive way. In the same way that I'm happy leaving the dojo. I know I learned something. I know I fortified myself and I'm ready to take on the world. So it should be the same. Your house is your dojo. Your whole world is your dojo, of course. But your significant other is your best sparring partner. No question. Mm-hmm. Now, if you had the chance to train with somebody else, somebody that you haven't, they can be alive, they can be dead from any time in history, anywhere in the world, who would you want to train with? Easy. Misha Tate. Okay. Easy. Why why Misha Tate? I'll give you five reasons. (laughs) All right. How about that? Um, One, because she just retired, so maybe she'll actually have time to do it. There's no point in me saying someone from history because that will never happen. But maybe, just maybe – Mishu can make some time for me. <laughs> uh, number two, um, she's a female in the martial arts. And whether she was back wrestling guys or I'm sure in her training camp, she works with guys. So uh, it's pretty much a common uh, piece of wisdom that it's the smaller, weaker teacher that has a better grasp on techniques because they have to. Um, you can't get away with a crazy Um, power and speed. You have to know the techniques and have good habits. So um, I respect that she's been grinding for a long time and uh, and probably mostly against dudes. And um, I would like to see her take on things, whether it's striking around the ground, whatever. I would just be interested to hear some tips from her. Um, Number three, because she's an elite athlete, but she's not a freak athlete. So I believe that her attributes are things that I can relate to that I probably could. There are some people like if you're some NFL Hall of Famer who can, you know, jump eight feet in the air. I don't care what tips that guy gives me. I'll never be able to do that. But um, Misha is a talented athlete, but I don't think she's uh, like super normal. I think that there is enough uh, accessibility to what she would tell me that I could actually make improvements. Um, four, she seems very intelligent. She has a podcast as well, the Misha Tate, uh, Tate Show. She seems very friendly, good sense of humor, and intelligent, able to break down concepts. So I think we could speak the same language. Um, and number five, because she always improved. When I watched like her early fights and then kind of followed her through up until the end, even when she lost, I recognized that there was an improvement in her skill set. 
So and that only comes from hard work. That only comes from being honest with yourself and taking the ego out of it. And some fighters you watch get worse over time, right? Some of these legends come back. Uh, I won't name names. That's sad. Uh, and, and they just look terrible. They get they're, they're worse as they go. They don't keep learning. They don't modify. But there are other people like Michael Jordan who modified his game as he got older. Um, and Misha Tate who just – she got sharper and she got better uh, even when she lost. So for all those reasons – uh, if Misha's listening, I would love to uh, get a private lesson just to kind of pick her brain a little bit and, um, you know, just see what's up. Great answer. And a very different answer than we've ever had. So I appreciate that. Sure. Now, you mentioned early on about Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon. I did. So I'm guessing you have some affinity for martial arts movies beyond just that one. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have some favorites you'd be willing to share with us? Yeah, uh, <laughs> let me go a little, maybe, uh, yeah. I'm embarrassed to say it. That's why I'm stalling. Um, <laughs> Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> Don't be, I will guarantee you will not pick the um, <laughs> the worst, the critically uh, considered worst films that have been mentioned on this show. Yeah, okay. Um, my absolute all-time number one guilty pleasure, favorite martial arts movie is Out for Justice with Steven Seagal. That movie is ridiculous. Uh, the beret, the accent, the trash talking, the violence. That thing is just, from beginning to end, pure joy. I, I will watch that movie anytime. The nice thing about living in Los Angeles is sometimes they take any film and put it up on a big screen. I've gone to see it on a big screen even after its initial release. I own it. I can quote it. It's just Oh, my God, I could watch that all day. So <laughs> that would be number one. And let me give you number two just because um, I don't know if anyone's ever mentioned this one. But it's interesting to me because it actually did have an effect on my life. Uh, and that was Defiance with Jan Michael Vincent. Um, I was only like around 10 when that came out. And I saw it. I don't know. It was like on TV, some rerun, whatever it was. And I'm not saying it's a great movie. But if you look at the fight scenes in that movie – they're beautiful. They're sloppy. They feel real. There's struggle. He's off balance. There's just weird, like pulling hair and throwing people into fences. It's just so far ahead when people talk about like, oh, the born identity and all these, oh, look how realistic and blah, blah. It's like, no, no, no. Go look on YouTube right now. Or if that's a copyright problem, don't do that. Go buy the movie. Um, Jan Michael Vincent, Defiance. And just look at the fight scenes. There's a scene on a basketball court. There's just take a look at those fight scenes because when I saw that as a kid, that was the antidote to the Bruce Lee stuff and the, the Kung Fu movie fantasy stuff where he never gets hit or, you know, it doesn't look cool. This was just a dude and it was, wasn't fast cutting. It was just this sloppy choreography, but in a good way. I mean, it looked like a real fight. And when I saw that as a kid, that made the other movies seem even more ridiculous because I said, now that's real. To me, as far as movie fighting, that looks real. And so that always affected my training. Like, it's okay to be sloppy. It's okay if something misses. It's okay to fall and stumble sometimes. Um, it's okay to take the hit. Keep going. That's what you get from the movie, Defiance. I defy you to beat me. Even if I'm losing, I defy you to finish me. Um, you just keep fighting. So there you go. Out for justice for laughs and defiance for uh, maybe recalibrating your idea of what a movie fight could look like. All right. How about books? Are you at all a reader? No. No. I hate books. Okay. <laughs> now, again, this is one of these life change things as I got older. In my 20s, early 30s, um, before this, particularly before the internet, um, I was all about the books. I was a mostly unemployed actor type guy, and all I had time for was to go to the library and go to bookstores. And it's sad, really. I made a circuit. In L.A., fortunately, there lots of bookstores, but I kept going to the same bookstores so people would kind of kick me out and say, hey, hey, you know, you're here every day. So I had to make a circuit. Like on Mondays, I'd go to the Barnes & Noble over there, and I'd go to the Crown Books over there on Wednesdays, and then I'd go to the library, and then I'd go. So I made a circuit, and I kept a notebook in my car, and I'd go in, and I promise you that at some point there, when I was about the age of 30, I had read or skimmed through every single book available on the market. And um, it took a long time to get over that kind of addiction. Again, I'm a little obsessive. So once I started that, hey, look from look at books. Hey, there's lots of information in these books. Um, I was all over it. But then again, I got older, and uh, it'll sound kind of cheesy, I suppose. But now I'm far more interested in reading people, not books. Um, 
this is martial arts. It's all about relationships. It's you in relation to another person. And yes, a book is a version of a person. It's a story someone's telling you. It's advice. But when you can look in someone's eyes and have that soul-to-soul contact and read them and see where they're coming from and feel what they're feeling as much as you can, that is just now my addiction. I'm more uh, than ever just into people. Um, and of course, I spend more time writing than reading. So I only have so many hours in the day. I'm, I'm, I'm tired a lot. So uh, that's the thing. But if I had to go back in time and recommend a couple of books, um, the ones that were a big deal to me when I was younger, um, of course, Book of Five Rings, blah, blah, blah. Everybody says that. And uh, Zen and the Martial Arts. Yes, yes, yes. But maybe one people don't know is um, Dan Millman's Body Mind Mastery. Uh, it's actually, I don't know why they keep changing the title. When I got the book, I think way back, it was called like the natural athlete. Then it was changed to the warrior athlete. But I believe last time I looked it up, he was calling it body mind mastery. And it's a really simple read very quick. Uh, and, uh, when I was, you know, 19 or 20, that made a big impression on me about just the naturalism that should be in your body, um, just from fixing your posture, breathing properly and how that can affect everything else you're doing in your life. Martial arts doesn't matter, everything. So I'd recommend that one um, to anybody. Right on. I'm a big Dan Millman fan. So. Oh, terrific. Yeah. So you're still training. You're going yeah. hard at your at your podcast, at your videos. You know, you've got a lot going on. And people don't work that hard at things unless they have goals. So what are your goals? What's keeping you moving forward? Um, well, I want to put the Whistle Kick podcast out of business. That's number one. <laughs> All right. Let, let's Trust do it. You. Let's br- bring it on. I'll take the challenge. <laughs> and after I'm done crushing your soul, then uh, really my goal, like I said, is uh, people. And this is the thing. Now that I'm finding there is an audience for whatever my brand of martial arts uh, you know, teachings uh, is uh, – you know, oh, you should do an online course. Oh, you should do webinars. Oh, you should. But, and I'm struggling with that right now. Like, well, do you, do you want to sell online courses? There's a lot of stuff I don't want to give out uh, for free just because I don't know who's watching it. I would rather have some kind of gate on that of like, eh, I don't want to feel, there's so many topics that I just don't want to put on YouTube. Um, so I'm going for, my goal here, for anybody listening, <laughs> is I want to, Get the message out that I'm alive and that uh, I'm a happy guy and martial arts changed my life and I think you should be training too. And then my goal ultimately would be to set up live training situations, Um, not just seminars. I mean the two-hour kind of deal on a Saturday, that's nice. I'll do it. But I would much rather do weekend camps or even week-long camps, retreats, um, because – That, I think, is how you really make an impact on someone's life. Live training is always better than reading it or seeing it on a video. And as a teacher of martial arts, you just got to put your hands on somebody. And you want to feel what they can do to you. And and that there's a beautiful relationship there that you can't even put into words. I can't put into a video. It's that ineffable stuff. It's that the Tao that can be spoken of is not the true Tao stuff. It's those lessons that you can only feel. And I would love to have small group training. In a retreat, we actually, I actually had that experience way back when, uh, as part of the Aikido, they would hold camps in the winter and in the summer, um, and you would just go out to a cabin in the middle of the woods, and this was before smartphones or anything, so everybody was really there, and you have like 30 or 40 people out in the woods for a week, and everyone's meditating together. You're practicing in the morning. You're practicing in the afternoon. You're practicing at night, and when you come out of that experience, you're different. I mean, those techniques are just in you in a different way than if you're going to an hour class, two hour class, a couple times a week. It's different. And that feeling that you have in your body and in your mind, that transformative experience lingers. It sticks with you. How many times do you go to a martial arts class? You think you have a great class and then the next day you you, you don't even think about remembering. It's just gone. It's just, okay, I'll go again the next time. But it's gone. I mean, sure, once in a while you have a significant event. You remember that. But. If you consider all the martial arts classes you've ever been to, how many memories do you have versus if you go to a seminar, even a two-hour seminar, you remember that seminar more, I believe, than most classes that you go to because it was a special event, because it went deeper into something that you don't normally get to do. If you turn that into a weekend uh, like Jesse Enkamp is doing uh, with, uh, over at Karate by Jesse, 
great teacher, and uh, he does like a weekend experience, the Karate Nerd Experience, so shout out to that. Um, bring different instructors together to give a small group of people uh, a deeper experience, love that. But then I would go even one step further, make it a week, and stick to not just a variety of things, but go deep into a few things, and just give people a transformative, holistic, full range experience. That would be my goal. Get the word out, let people know I want to do that, uh, I just fear that there aren't enough people interested in it. <laughs> uh, Dr. Yang, do you know Dr. Yang uh, from Boston there, uh, the guy with all the books, Dr. I know uh, Yang Bing Ming? Yeah, I know the name. I and I feel so him. sorry for him because he's this guy. He's legit. Right? He's a Kung Fu guy, a Tai Chi guy, a Qigong guy. He's got wonderful books. He's very professorial in his tone. He's got a great reputation, I believe. And he, I mean, I, I might get some of these facts wrong, but a few years ago, he set up a camp out here in California where he was going to take like 20 students in and it was going to be like a 10 year program. And he was going to teach them everything he knew. And then at the end of it, you'd get your money back so you could start a school and carry on the lineage and carry on the arts. And it was, I think, a Black Belt magazine put an ad out for it. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. That's fantastic. 10 years, you go in like this temple like experience. And last time I checked, I mean, I was casually kind of watching what was happening there. And then I think the number, well, instead of a 10 years, it'll be five years. There's an option for the smaller program. And, and I don't think we had 20 people got injured or there weren't enough signups. So we we're down to like 12 or it just seemed to kind of not catch fire. I was hoping there'd be more of those and it would just blow up and there'd be a huge waiting list and everyone's clamoring to get in. So that makes me a little nervous, but um, I do believe with uh, the right positioning and the right messaging that everybody would feel comfortable coming to a retreat like that and just rebuilding themselves like a boot camp for life where you just come in and through a martial arts uh, filter, work out your issues, work technique, make new friends. And then when you leave, you've got something from martial arts that's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. I believe that's the, the best way. You can't count on people sticking into a program for two years, four years, five years. I mean, the dropout rate is always huge for these types of you know martial arts schools. So if you can just grab them, have like a beginner's camp, have an intermediate camp, have an advanced camp, whatever, break it up any way you want. But that to me is the ultimate goal. Face-to-face, hands-on training. Um, I can't think of anything more gratifying than that. Rock on. Now this is kind of your commercial time. So take a few minutes, let the listeners know where they can find you, what they'll find when they find you and what sure. you might be able to offer to them. Yeah, well um, – just come on over to senseiando.com or fightforahappylife.com. And the best thing you can do is uh, if you like anything I'm talking about, uh, get on my email list. I'm not selling anything. I'm just, um, you know, maybe two two times, three times a month at most, I'll send you something just to say, hey, I got a new video, got a new podcast. Uh, let me just tell you what's going on. Um, I'm just trying to build that community of people who are like-minded, love martial arts, who see it as more than just an alternative to going to the gym, who see it as a lifestyle. Um, and want to be part of that, be part of the movement of just building up team good guys. Uh, so if you put your name on that list, no big deal. I'm not going to harass you. Um, <laughs> come on by and at least you'll know we can stay in touch. If you got a question, let me know. I'm always available. And, um, yeah, let's just build a bigger community. That's all. For sure. And if you had to instill some parting words of wisdom, you know, club, club the listeners over the head with a few nuggets to tie it all up what would those be um let me just repeat the themes that we kind of got into earlier one my advice is to be you don't be anybody else don't be your teacher don't be your dad don't be anybody really use the martial arts as your time to get rid of all the falsity get rid of all the illusions and just be you and when you find out what what you are Play those strengths as deeply as you can. Work those things. Play them the best you can. Then once you, you've got that, <laughs> and that's a changing pro- an ever-changing process, I understand, then be an ambassador. Don't hide. I did it for years. I did it for decades of just keeping martial arts as like it's my thing. Maybe once in a while I'd mention it, but basically it was my private time to work on myself. Um, and that doesn't help anybody, Right. Once you have something of value, something that's life-changing, which I'm sure every listener here, if you're a martial artist, you probably are. I'm sure martial arts has changed your life in a positive way, and that's why you're listening to this podcast. You want more positivity. You want more community. And how can you keep that to yourself? 
I know you've probably already tried talking to your, your wife or your brother or your friend and said, yeah, come on to class. It's great. But they haven't come, have they? They haven't gone with you or they went one time and they didn't change their clothes or they, <laughs> they never came back. Something's wrong. Something is very wrong. And I'm part of that. I mean, I'm still trying to figure that out too, but let's not give up. Let's be ambassadors. There's, there's some, isn't there some line in the Bible about you'll know us by our actions or you'll know us by our deeds, something like that. Um, it should be the same with martial artists. When you're in a room of people, they should notice that your posture is a little better. You're a little calmer than everybody else. Your focus is a little stronger. There's something about you. You keep your word. You are, you are somehow noble. And when they dig a little deeper, like, what do you do? What are you into? It should be the first words out of your mouth. Oh, I practice martial arts. Yeah. So they know you're leading by example. You are wearing that on your sleeve. I'm not saying wear your gi outside of the house. That You deserve to get beat up if you do that. I, I don't like that. But be the best person you can be and don't be shy about letting people know that martial arts is how you got there and it's helping you continue to be your best. And I believe if, if every martial artist was a little more transparent about their process, a little more uh, generous in sharing what they've been doing in their classes and how it's changed their life, I don't know why everybody wouldn't be signed up. Why shouldn't every martial arts school have a line out the door of people signed up for this stuff? Because I is what's better? This is, there's nothing better. You know that. There's nothing better. What's better for therapy, for fitness, for mind, body, spirit, health? There's nothing better. So for God's sake, don't keep it a secret. Get out there. Be an ambassador. Represent martial arts. And let's just make the world a better place. Sensei Ando is yet another person I've spoken with on this show that makes me crave a trip to the West Coast. We spent a solid half hour before and after the show chatting, and I have no doubt that we could burn up a long evening talking martial arts. He's a good man and hosts a great podcast. I hope you'll check it out. Thank you, Sensei Ando, for coming on the show. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes with a ton of links. We talked about a lot of different stuff today. You can get easy access to Sensei Ando's show, social media, and a ton more so check those out. You can follow us on social media too. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Our username is Whistlekick. You should also check out the Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. You know, we're always up to have new guests on the show, so if you want to come on or you have somebody you want to recommend, go ahead, hit the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and you can fill out the form over there. If you've got some other feedback, fill out the form, or go ahead, email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. The next time your legs are cold, don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> if you want a pair of our awesome sweats, those are at whistlekick.com. And if you want to support us in some other way, leaving a review or my favorite one, sharing the show with somebody else, I'd really personally appreciate that. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.